Hi folks, as promised, I'm just going to go through this exam paper uh, and of course just also showing how I would approach it as well. Um, so I've looked at examiner notes on certain questions. So, you know, examiners for certain years will identify certain questions that were very poorly answered or some are very, you know, well answered. Um, so I'll do this as quickly and as efficiently as I can. However, I just need to do a stop off at question one and just confront a few things here and then the rest should be ticking as I go. So looking at this one, which compound can form a polyer without needing another reagent? Interesting. If I look here, there's nothing to tell me. There's no addition polymers here at all. Um, from the looks of it, I see alcohols, I see dicarboxylic acids, and there's actually um, an acyl chloride group as well. Um, because for those of you that may have done a bit of extra reading, um, you can check a page, I think it's 262 in your books, they talk about a few ways polyesters are made. Um, we focused on one, um, which was dicarboxylic acids and diols, but there are a few bits and pieces to just add on to this as well. So this idea without needing another reagent, so I just want to kind of cover this content first. So if we look at how I produce polymers, uh, condensation polymers to be more exact, there are two ways I can do this. One of them is what we're familiar with already, um, where we have two reagents with two functional groups. So that's like our dicarboxylic acids and our diols and our diamines, okay? There's also another way we can make polyesters as well. So very similar to dicarboxylic acids, we can have diacyl chlorides as well. So very simply, just like dicarboxylic acids will have two carboxylic acid groups, diacyl chlorides will have two acyl chloride groups. And if we can recall from that, an acyl chloride looks like this carbonyl group um, with a chlorine on there. So essentially the idea of this polyester, we know that the polymers are named by the linkage. So whether it's a dicarboxylic acid and a diol, or a diacyl chloride and a diol, I will end up with that um, ester linkage, okay? So if you can just recall from this step here, now I know it's not answering this question, I just need to just go through this first. So obviously there's a removal of water here. I get rid of water here. Uh, in this case where it's a diacyl chloride and a diol, um, the chlorine will um, pretty much go off with one of the H's off of a diol and rather than get rid of, getting rid of um, water, I get rid of HCl, okay? And I can actually make esters, polyesters that way, okay? I do get an ester linkage. And again, if you look on page 262, you can see that as well. Not answering my question though, uh, without needing another reagent, I can see here, either way, whether it's this route or this route, I rely on another reagent. So I just step back to polymers. There is another way I can form polymers, um, even condensation polymers. And it's where I have one reagent with two different functional groups. So rather than having a dicarboxylic acid or a diol, I would have a molecule that would have um, a carboxylic acid group and it would also have an alcohol group, okay? So if I have something like this, where it's the one, just the one reagent, um, I can form um, a polyester. Um, because again, knowing how it's this sort of monomer here links up with others, I still remove the OH um, from the carboxylic acid and I still remove the H from the alcohol, thus creating an ester linkage for polyesters. Similarly, I can do the same as I mentioned here with an acyl chloride. So again, thinking of one reagent, I can have my, for example, um, specifically, um, I have an alcohol group, okay, as one of functional group and another functional group, I can have my acyl chloride here, okay? So, car oh, not carboxylic acid, apologies. <laughs> that is my alcohol okay and similarly again um this will bond with the h so again think of this as a monomer forming chains the chlorine and the will bond with the hydrogen here will go off and hcl is eliminated again i form an ester linkage it is still a polyester 
Now, thinking about that and taking that into account, just going back to question number one, and this is the only question I'll be covering that content on. Um, so again, let's look at what we have here. So again, without needing another reagent. So it's going to be this option here of the one reagent with two different functional groups, okay? So that eliminates A. It can't be A because it's got two of these. Can't be B. It's between C and D. And if we look very closely at D, I see that I've got a carboxylic acid and a chlorine. And again, what we're to cover in AQA does not form a polymer. However, if I look at C, I've got my acyl chloride group and an alcohol group, which again can make my polymer. This is the accepted answer, okay? So that is C there. Perfect. Okay, again, page 262 is just, it's the exact same process as dicarboxylic acids. The only difference is it's an acyl chloride and an alcohol and I eliminate HCl. So that's not too bad. Okay. So question number two, terylene is made by reacting uh, benzene 1,4 dicarboxylic acid and ethane 1,2-diol. Terylene is, as we know, is a polyester. And while I'm here, uh, you need to know um, the polymer of this. Uh, it's also known as PET as well. You need to know that. And you also need to know how to draw out the monomers that make it, okay? That is on the spec. You have to know that, make sure you're comfortable. Moving on. Okay, so the repeating uni unit of a polymer is shown. So which monomer of, or a pair of monomers could be used to make this polymer? So just having a quick look at my answers here. Um, I can see that we're dealing with that um, acyl chloride again, which kind of, you know, substitutes for the carboxylic acid. Okay, so I'll just have that here. Now, again, if I'm given any polymer, uh, as, you know, as complicated as it may look, as long as you identify the link, you should be able to identify the monomer or pair of monomers that make it up. So if I look at this, I notice here that I have my amide link, okay? So it's a polyamide, and polyamides, amide, amide link, is when a nitrogen is bonded to a carbonyl group. That's what makes a polyamide a polyamide. Now, what makes a polyamide? Well, what we come across, what we've come across before in the slides is that, well, you can have a carboxylic acid and um, an amine. Um, acyl chloride can behave very similarly in this case. So I expect um, the easiest way to do it is if you can just imagine what um, might be bonded here. So again, you'd have your Chlor um, acyl chloride here, and then you would have your amine here. So which monomer, so obviously it's gonna be a pair of monomers, okay? And which one can form something like this, okay? So obviously we've got what would have been here um, would have been an acyl chloride and an acyl chloride, okay? So we have a diacyl chloride monomer, and we also would have had a diamine monomer. So if there's any answers here that can illustrate that, Uh, yes. So again, it's going to be either C or D. Now again, looking carefully at the chain, I can see that was on the acyl chloride was a CH24. Okay, so that matches up. And then with the, um, the amine, it would have been a CH26. Okay, so again, cannot be D because does not um, equate to the formula up here. So it must be C. Okay, moving on. So we see um, the structure of part of a polyester chain is shown. And that's, is that down here or over here? Ah, here it is. Okay, perfect. Um, so which statement correctly explains why plastics made from the polyester only soften at high temperatures? Now I can tell you that the year this question was up, 96% got it wrong because they forgot one simple thing. OK, so your instinct may go straight to hydrogen bonds. OK, and that's what most people put down. But that's actually incorrect. OK, people need to realize that hydrogen must be bonded to a more electronegative element in order um, to partake in these hydrogen bonds. OK, here all the hydrogens are attached to the carbons, which are van der Waal forces. OK, a lot of confusion happened with this question. 
Okay, so I can see obviously there's permanent dipole dipoles here, and there's also our van der Waals here. Um, so it's not the first one. Again, hydrogen must be bonded to a more electronegative element for it to partake in hydrogen bonding. So it's bonded to a nitrogen, uh, oxygen, fluorine, etc. So the answer is B. Okay, do not forget that. Um, right, question five. So again, this is kind of trailing back to esters and something that we did in amine. So question five, common substances occur in everyday life, often containing organic compounds. State in everyday use for each of the following compounds. So if we look at the first one, uh, the end of the molecule here um, has this sort of ionic bond happening between the COO minus and this Na plus. This is very typical. This is a soap, okay? We've come across this before. This is a soap. We talked about esters making soap. This being the final product is our soap. Uh, the next one, very similar, we're still in polyesters. And I see rather than this ionic bond at the end here, I have this... Um, uh, pretty much methyl group, okay? So if I remember with methyls and esters, this is actually a biodiesel. This particular compound, again, stating everyday use is what you need to do. Everyday use for this is soap. This one is biodiesel, if I can spell it. Now the next one looks a little bit complicated, but again, just breaking down the molecule. So what can I, what's, what can I distinguish here? Very, very, very long hydrocarbon chain very long, okay? I also have this nitrogen here, and this nitrogen is bonded to hydrogen and three of these methyl groups with the charge. This is a quaternary amine, okay? A quaternary, or I should say, a, a, yeah, a quaternary amine, where the nitrogen is bonded to four other atoms, which gives this positive charge. And not only that, it's also um, in this sort of ionic bond with bromide, so what is um, typical of a long hydrocarbon chain, a quarter, an ammonium salt, pretty much, uh, with an ionic bond with the halogen? So if you remember from quaternary amines, this is actually what's called a catatonic surfactant. Again, if you remember the long nonpolar chain, okay, and then you had the polar head here, um, which is derived from these, and again, the typical quaternary um, amine structure of the nitrogen bonded to three, one, sorry, four other um, atoms with this ionic bond here. Catatonic surfactant. And with a catatonic surfa surfactant, catatonic surfactant, um, the use of this is in shampoos and detergents, okay? So remember I said about the negative charge, the frizz in your hair? Um, well, catatonic surfactant, these um, ammonium salts are put in to sort of um, get rid of the staticness. Okay, it reacts with the sort of negative charge of the static, um, as well as the polar for the water as well, this polar head is here. Um, so shampoos, detergents, same as fabric softener, just like our hair gets static, so does the um, clothes that we wear. And again, we use these quaternary salts because of the non-polar tail, can get rid of the dirt, etc. and the polar head, which will react with that sort of negative electric charge. Right, uh, part B. Uh, the following structures are the repeating units, and I want to talk about this, uh, what's the difference between this and a formula pretty much in a second. So of two different condensation polymers, for, um, for each example, name the type of condensation polymer and give a common name. So that goes back to, um, if you remember the nylon, Kevlar, terylene, you're supposed to know those for condensation um, polymers. So type of condensation polymer, well, I can see that there's an ester linkage, which is usually formed when, um, hold on a second, type of, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> sorry, just had a bit of a brain fart there. Um, yeah, so obviously we can see here, it's a condensation polymer. I thought I was asking me if it was condensation or addition there for a second. Um, so I can see here, there's an ester linkage, very typical ester linkage here. So it is a polyester. Again, the polymer is named depending on the linkage that it has. The common name for this typical one, which you 
you do need to know. Um, so this is actually terylene, okay? This is our terylene. Uh, also known as PET, either is accepted. Okay, again, you should be able to recognize this as terylene, you should be able to draw it as terylene, and also draw the monomers involved there. Right, moving on, am I on this page? No, am I over here, page four? Yes, okay. So very similar question highlighting the importance of knowing those specific uh, common names. So again, looking at this type of polymer, uh, you should know this anyway by looking at it. Um, but again, I can see that I've got an amide link here. So this is a poly amide. And the common name for this is Kevlar. Kevlar is that bulletproof um, polymer um, that's obviously used in bulletproof vests. It's also used in a lot of sports equipment. And if you actually look at how uniform this um, polymer is, the, the molecules can actually move quite close together, which is attributes to how strong it is. Um, stronger than steel and denser than steel, which is why it's really useful. Um, so explain why the polymer in part B, BII, sorry, yeah, that's, that's here. Why does this have a higher melting point than in the polymer? So every time I look at these physical properties, a like higher melting point, I just quickly identify um, the kind of bonds that it has. So obviously with this benzene ring, it's gonna have, I mean, all molecules have van der Waals anyway. Um, and I can also see, not only does it have van der Waals, it also has this dipole, dipole here. So it's got dipole, dipole. Does it have anything stronger than that? Is there a hydrogen bond present? Sorry, I spelled that wrong. So I always identify the types of charges, or sorry, uh, intermolecular forces first. Uh, again, so there is hydrogen bonding does occur here. A hydrogen is bonded to a more electronegative element, um, which means it has hydrogen H bonding, okay? So that's quite strong. I would hazard a guess that maybe the um, terylene may not have um, hydrogen bonding, but let's have a look. So, yeah. So again, we've got the strongest, so obviously it's got van der Waals, all molecules do. Um, it also has that um, dipole, dipole, and again, no hydrogen bonding. It must be bonded to a more electronegative uh, negative element for it to be, for hydrogen to partake in hydrogen bonding. So that's pretty much why. So how would I answer this? And it's got no, no H bonding. So Kevlar does, which, what is, which is why it has a higher boiling point. So explain, and again, worth two marks. So the first mark would be that you would identify um, that Kevlar has hydrogen bonding And again, explaining, so you have to uh, you have to add on to that, uh, which is stronger than dipole, dipole, um, which is stronger than dipole, dipole that terylene possess, or something along those lines. So just always look at the molecule and identify the types of um, intermolecular forces present. If it is H-bonding, it's going to be quite strong. And that's where one for identifying that is H-bonding, two for explaining that the reason why it's stronger is because that's H-bonding and H-bonding is stronger than um, dipole dipole. Right, next one. Uh, question six, uh, there are several isomers with the molecular formula C6H16N2. Woo. One isomer is shown, and it's shown like this, we've got a bit of a branch going on. Um, so give the number of peaks in the CNMR spectrum of this isomer. Um, state and explain the splitting pattern. So I'm doing this, give number of peaks. I underline as well, I, always, um, I would always encourage you to underline because you'd be very surprised um, how many times that students tend to not answer what's being asked, okay? So state and perspective patterns of the peaks for hydrogen labeled A uh, in its HMR spectrum, okay? So here I name my carbon peaks. So again, we talk about, um, when we think about carbon peaks, uh, it tells us uh, how many carbon environments there are, okay? So let's have a look here. 
So if I look at this carbon here, is there any other carbon that experiences the same neighbors pretty much or bonded to the same atoms, okay? And experiences the same environment. So I can see that the one below it, just like the one above is attached to a CH2, which is attached to an N. These two experience the same environment, which counts for one. That's what that NMR machine picks up. So similarly, just like the next one here, the CH2, just like the one very symmetrical, just like the one below it, uh, bonded to a methyl group, bonded to a methyl group, bonded to nitrogen, bonded to nitrogen. That's our second carbon environment. So that's two. So we move along here to this one here. So this C, this carbon on this CH2 uh, is bonded to nitrogen, bonded to here, uh, which is also bonded on the right-hand side to CH2 to an NH2. There are no other carbons present in this molecule that experience the same environment. They're bonded to the same kind of atoms. Okay, so that is um, an environment on its own. So that's number three. And the same reason for this last one, um, this carbon bonded here is bonded directly beside a nitrogen and at the left hand side is another carbon, etc. No other carbons experience the same environment, they're not bonded um, to the same atoms as this one, so that's an environment in itself. So the answer is if I had a HNMR machine, uh, I would see um, four peaks to indicate four environments. Now, splitting patterns, let's talk about this on A. So we talk about the splitting pattern. So again, um, if I was to just open up this here, I might do that a bit better. So carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen. So this is here. Obviously this hydrogen experiences the same environment as this hydrogen. But when we talk about the splitting pattern, we're sort of talking about the carbons which is adjacent to this hydrogen environment, okay? And the hydrogens that are adjacent to this hydrogen environments are over here, they're the nearest ones, okay? So I see that this carbon is bonded to two hydrogens. So this hydrogen environment has two hydrogen neighbors beside it, okay? Um, and then there's this thing called the N plus rule. So we call this pattern a triplet. So we talk about splitting patterns. It's just talking about the hydrogens adjacent to that, that A environment. What's adjacent to it is two, um, two hydrogens, and there's this N plus one rule. Therefore, it is a triplet, okay? Uh, and the explanation is exactly what I've just said. So you would say that it's a triplet. So um, is a triplet due to the two neighboring hydrogens, hydrogens uh, on the adjacent carbon. And if you'd like, you can also just say, again, you've got the marks there very simply, but you can also say um, N plus one rule as well. Perfect, okay. So that's that. And again, explanation, that's why you need to add a little bit more there. Right, now we all, oh yeah, here's another one. So draw the structure of the isomer C6H16N2 used to make nylon 6,6. Six. Um, right, so I should know, again, just like Terlin and Kevlar, I'm required to know this polyamide inside out. I should, by this going by the spec, I should know how to draw this. And I should also know the monomers and the structure of those monomers. I just remembered, I actually was meant to explain about um, repeating units and forgot, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so draw the structure of the isomer to make nylon 6-6. Six, six. Well, I know um, that my nylon is made, where can I draw this? So if I should, well, obviously we know it's made from a carb, a dicarboxylic acid, uh, and it's made from a diamine. So obviously because of the ends being present, it must be that diamine because there's two ends. Um, so as I should know, it's one six diaminohexane, and that's what I'm required to know. Anyway, where am I drawing this? I haven't got. Um, okay, I'll do my best to do it here. Okay, so all that you have to name it, it's just asking you to draw. And again, so my diamine 
okay? And again, this is my CH2, and there's six of them. That's why it's actually called nylon 6-6, six, six, because the monomer derived, that's, you know, the monomer that is um, the diamine is a six carbon chain. And from the dicarboxylic acid is also a six carbon chain. So that's why it's called nylon 6-6. Six, six. Um, you can get different kinds of nylon. Um, 610 is another one. And fun fact, it's called nylon, New York, London. I think it's because the people that discovered it were from there. And I could be completely wrong, but that's where it's derived from. New York, London. Anyway, I digress. So again, my dye. So this is my 1,6-diaminohexane here, okay? That is the diamine that makes nylon. Moving on. Oh, our favourite. <laughs> okay, so draw the structure of the isomer. So it's an isomer that contains two primary amine groups and has only two peaks in its CNMR spectrum. Interesting. So this is always kind of trial and error, but we can kind of break it down from the question. So I know that it has two primary amine groups, which means an amine group will only be attached. So whatever this isomer is, the amines involved will only be attached to one other carbon. Why? Because it's a primary amine. So at least I've got that, okay? So that's bonded to another carbon, okay? Um, and again, always keeping this in mind, always referring back to this to help out, okay? So I've got this, and I know I've actually got it drawn. How did I derive? Oh yeah, perfect. So I've got another amine group. So I know this amine group is attached to one other carbon. Okay, so, so far, I have used up one, two, three, four hydrogens. So I've got what, 14 more to fill. I've used up two carbons. I've got four more and my nitrogens are gone. So I'm just trying to see, is there a way that I can place four carbons and 14 hydrogens? Keeping in mind, I need to have two peaks, so two carbon environments. So this carbon environment and this a carbon environment is one so far because um, again, you know, they're, they're experiencing the same environment, they have the same neighbours. So I'm wondering, I could just try and start branching them off. Okay, so is, is there a way, again, this is one environment. Now, is there a way I can attribute four of these and fourteen of these in a way that I can allow it to cause only one other peak? So this being one, how do I make this be the second? So I could just start branching them off here, okay? So I could just have a CH3 maybe over here. Just try this out. Maybe CH3 over here. And can I do this in a way? Yeah, I can do this in a way that the carbons here will experience the same environment as the carbons here if I do it this way. And we'll just double check our work because I'm fairly confident. Okay, so let's just check that I've met my formula criteria. Six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. Bam, 16 hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Oh, I thought it, my heart went there. I thought I said 14, perfect. Two nitrogens, excellent. So I've got that at least. I've also met my criteria of two primary amine groups where these amines are bonded to one other carbon. So that's good. Now, does this experience two peaks? Well, yes, because the carbons in the center here uh, is, are attributes to one peak because they experience the exact same environment. This bonded to an N, bonded to two methyl groups. This bonded to an N, bonded to two methyl groups, one environment. This carbon and this carbon experience the same environment. Same as this carbon and this carbon. So these carbons experience the same environment as these carbons. Okay, because it's like a methyl, so this carbon bonds to a carbon, bonds to an N. Carbon, carbon, N, carbon, carbon, N, carbon, carbon, N, etc. So if I put this molecule in a CNMR machine, it would pick up two peaks. Perfect. 
go on to the next one. So again, guys, this just takes practice, it's not a trial and error, looking at the question, what information do you have and how can you fix the rest of the leftover carbons, hydrogens to meet the criteria in the question, okay? Now, next one, draw the same structure, but this time, so we're still dealing with two peaks, okay? Same formula. The only difference is we've got two tertiary amines. So that's given us some info. So a tertiary amine, as we should know already, is an amine that's bonded to three other carbons. So this actually might be a bit easier than this because I can start taking off car um, carbons fairly quickly. Keeping in mind two peaks, right? So amine group is bonded to three other carbons. Carbon over here, carbon over here, carbon over here. And you know what? nitrogen can't be bonded to anything else anyway. Uh, because it's got three going on there. Uh, amine group now pff, is the amine group up here. I'm going to do it in a way that I can just create um, one carbon environment. So I'll just try this. I'll try just like I've done up here. I might just fire the amine at the other end. And again, it's tertiary amine bonded to one, two, three carbons. So, so far, I've got my six carbons done. Got my two nitrogens. Can I fit 16 hydrogens in a way that will hopefully end up a 16 fitting nicely and that would only come up with two peaks? So two peaks as well. So I'd imagine these carbons would experience the same environment. So that will be one environment. So this, these carbons, again, that lovely sort of cut off branch, they usually have the same environment anyway. Just going to fit the hydrogens, hope for the best. They do, they do become a lot easier, this, this isomer business. It's like a skill built over time, okay? So let's see, I've got 16 H's. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16. Whew, right, 16. All right, let's have a look at our, so I've got that. I've got that. Uh, two peaks, yes, because this is one environment. And again, these carbons experience the same environment as these carbons, so this, is the same as this, is the same as this, is the same as this. So criteria met, beautiful. All right, moving on to question seven. Okay, so repeating, um, repeating units. Oh, now I'm gonna talk about repeating units. <laughs> okay, before I do, I'm gonna just explain now because I'm gonna forget. Um, so there's a few things um, when it comes to repeating units. So anytime I talk about a monomer and anytime I draw on a monomer, it's really important that whatever the monomer is, uh, let's just take, just, just do ethene for the sake of it. It's really important to identify this as the monomer ethene and not ethene by itself, I need to put this N to denote that, okay? Because that just it, that just means there's a number of these, like thousands of them, etc. That denotes a monomer, okay? Monomer. Um, similarly, when we make our polymer, so let's say we're going to make this polymer here. The repeating unit, and don't confuse this with the formula, the repeating unit is simply this. This is the repeating unit. I see this mistake a lot. And then again, you've got your trailing bonds are slightly more elongated. That is the repeating unit. No N, repeating unit. All you're showing is you've got, you know, the, the double bonds break up. Okay, you've got your um, polyethene here. Uh, and again, you're, the trailing bond showing that there are more of this monomer um, connected to the chain, etc. That is the repeating unit. If you want to draw the equation, that's where these brackets come in, making sure the trailing bonds move beyond the bracket, as well as denoting N here to say that there's a number of this of these um, polymers, so that this um, repeating unit has been replicated thousands of times, okay? So what's in red is what is the equation. Monomer, and on the right hand side with the double bonds for addition anyway. Repeating unit is just these single bonds and the trailing ones here. And then if you want to show the equation, you put the two brackets, trailing bonds go beyond it, and then an N representing a, a number of something, a large number usually on the bottom left hand, bottom right hand side. Okay, so just again, because examiners, if they, if you, if they ask you for a repeating unit and you give them this, 
depending, I mean, they may not accept it. They may let it go once, but if they see you do it again, you just need to show them that you understand what a repeating unit is. And that's without the red. Okay, done. So repeating units of the polymers, and again, it's shown here, repeating unit, notice there's no brackets, there's no N, it's the repeating unit, same as this. Of two polymers, uh, P and Q are shown in figure below. Draw the structure of the monomer used to form polymer P. Okay, so very simply, uh, the monomer will be, I can tell that it's addition, obviously. So it's a C double bond C, because as the monomer, it's gonna be um, sort of an unsaturated molecule. H, CH3, CH3, CL. And again, because it's a monomer, I denote it with my N here. Okay, this is my monomer, no trading bonds. There's a double bond here, which will eventually break, etc. Um, but that's my monomer. Okay, um, moving on to the next one. I think that's the page beside me, if I'm not wrong. Page five out of 10, I should be moving on to six. Come on, laptop, let's not freeze now. I wonder if I just I'm pause. I'm just going to pause the share until this behaves. Hold on. Oh no, it's sharing. Can I pause the pause recording for a sec? Okay, and that behaved again. So it's also asking me for the, that monomer I just drew. It's asking me for the type of polymerization. I know that that's an addition. It's addition. Polymerization. Perfect. Uh, now it's asking me to draw the two compounds that react together to form polymer Q. So I'm just going to get this up here. Um, so that's this down here. So I'll just show you how can I figure out um, what reacts together to form it. So first of all, let's have a look here. And again, I know the kind of polymer depending on the linkage involved and straight away I can see that there is an ester link. So it's gonna be a polyester. Um, so what will happen is in this case uh, with the polyester is what I do is I just split down the middle here of the bridging oxygen. I always just split down the middle and I just add my OH onto this carboxylic acid. And I can see as there's a trailing bond here, it is um, a dicarboxylic acid and this is a diol. So I just split that there and draw the monomers involved. So just bear with me now. Sorry, it's a little bit messy. Okay. So I can just... Structure of compound one, let's just draw this. Okay, so it's a C and a C, it's a diol. If memory serves, it's got two methyl groups down here. Now it's asked me to draw a monomer that I have to put the N down there to form polymer. Draw the two structures of the two compounds to form polymer. I feel like putting an N there to be safe because it's saying to form a polymer. I'm gonna leave it as it is anyway, either way. Um, that's the structure of compound one. All right, and if I just scroll down here, again, all I do with this molecule, the split here, I add an OH to this C here to make it a carboxylic acid and an OH here. So I wonder if I can just, so that's this guy over here. So again, C double bond O, there's going to be an OH, C, CH3. And the bonds are okay. C double bond O, and it's a dicarboxylic acid OH. So perfect. Excellent. Okay. What's also accepted here, because it's a polyester, and just linking back what I mentioned in question one, uh, you're more than welcome, not more than welcome, but you can actually make this, oh, hold on, or can you? Yeah, you can. Uh, you can make this, what's also accepted uh, is if you put this down instead, because uh, 
and a diacyl chloride will also make a polyester and you remove HCl instead of water. So you, this is perfectly acceptable as well. Get rid of these. And that's accepted too. Okay. Um, I might just do like a, put just put an OH up here in brackets. You know, because either it's a dicarboxylic acid or a diacyl chloride. Now, let's have a look here. Um, suggest an environmental impact of polymer Q over polymer P. So this would be nearing the end of the slides that I showed you. And please, please don't take these kinds of questions for granted. They talk about landfills, in, in incineration, recycling, advantages, disadvantages, etc. What in what in what kinds of plastic would you use for this type of disposal? Please do look back at those and don't take them for granted. Um, so suggest an environmental ad advantage. Uh, do, 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 do. Very simply, um, addition polymers, as you know, are really, really strong. They only make one product. They're long, 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 long chains. Uh, and they're they're very stable. And the fact that they're very stable is, is why it's so popular, but it's also their demise as well when it comes to disposal. You cannot break them down. It's very difficult to break addition polymers down. So polymer Q is good because it reacts with water and because it can react with nucleophiles it can be broken down it's what's called biodegradable and it's really important that you know that a huge difference between the disposal of um condensation polymers versus addition polymers so an advantage would be that it's biodegradable so um just put condensation polymer is biodegradable that's your first mark and the second mark then that goes for that is um so because as well actually i should talk about this a little bit um so looking at the kinds of reactions for this particular polymer i know that i've got my dipole dipoles and because of these dipole dipoles, and there's no hydrogen bonding. Yeah, there's no hydrogen bonding in the polymer, not the monomer. So we're talking about the polymer here. Okay, they're long chains. So because of this presence of the dipole dipole, so that C, you know, uh, presence um, in Q, in the condensation polymer um, can be attacked by nucleophiles and can therefore break down. So if you remember polyesters, um, we can even, even polyamides, um, hydrolysis using water to break down those molecules it, it, it's incredibly simple you would do exactly the opposite um that you would you take water out of the system to make the link you put water into the system to break those linkages um similarly as well um nucleophiles like even the oh that comes off of a water even off of like sodium hydroxide um this can be attacked by nucleophiles if you just look at the structure um it's susceptible to attack therefore it's broken down, hence biodegradability. And again, there is a part in the spec, if you haven't seen it already, um, you need to know that, okay? It's to do with the intermolecular forces of both addition polymers and condensation polymers, okay? And what does that mean? And you know how it can be broken down because of that, et cetera? Why is it strong? Blah, blah, blah. Right, moving on to question eight. Which polymer is least likely to be biodegraded after seven several years in a landfill site. So I see I've left no. Oh, here we are. <laughs> so it's a yeah, it's this um here. So I've got Kevlar. So which is least likely to be biodegraded? Well, I know that Kevlar and nylon are condensation polymers, and condensation polymers can be biodegraded. So eliminate that. Eliminate that. Polythene, also known as polyethene. Um, is an addition polymer, okay? And their addition polymers are very unreactive. 
Um, they're very, very durable. Um, so I'm guessing this may be the answer, but let's look at the last one. Terylene is a condensation polymer, therefore it's susceptible to nuclear flick attack. The answer is C. Um, it, it is, it can be burnt. Uh, again, just looking over incineration, recycling, and um, landfill sites, you need to know the kinds of plastic that's suited towards them, the advantages and disadvantages of them as well. But again, we're moving more and more towards biodegra biodegradable um, materials, which is good. I mean, science is really advancing in, in that area, which is good to see. Um, but again, the addition polymers, incredibly unreactive. And because they're unreactive, they do not, <laughs> they do not degrade, if at all, okay? Um, question number nine, nearly there, folks. Right, so um, items softened with plasticizers have become an essential part of the modern society. Um, compound S shown below is commonly known as um, phthalic acid, da, 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 PVC, perfect. So what we're doing, we're doing the IUPAC name. So very simply, if you're familiar with the dicarboxylic acids dealt with those poly um, amides and, and polyesters, uh, the naming of this isn't too bad. So I suppose there's kind of two accepted answers here. So you could just do um, one, so benzene, benzene ring, benzene, and then again, because we're moving to a number, one, two, dicarboxylic acid. And that's it there. So again, first carbon, second carbon, third carbon, hence the one, two. Okay. Another accepted answer, a kind of lesser popular one is um, one, two, benzene dicarboxylic acid. It's just another accepted one, but I, I prefer, I think it makes more sense the first one does. Don't say benzo, benzene. Okay, um, draw the displayed formula. Again, repeating unit, should be seeing brackets, shouldn't be seeing that in, of a polychloroethane. Um, so again, displayed form of this, so I have my single bond CC. Uh, again, CL polychloroethane. And all I need there is my trailing bonds. And that's it. That is it. That is my repeating unit. No brackets, no N, unless they ask for the formula. Right. Okay. Last one. Uh, well, not last one. Um, getting there. <laughs> um, so Esther is used in food packaging. Perfect. Complete the following equation. Okay. So, so you're just completing this equation up here. Now, they're being a bit mean because I think they have you, um, your head sort of focused on um, polyesters and, and polymers, etc. that sometimes, um, you know, it might influence your answer here, okay? This isn't, there is no polymers here. Um, again, your brain can be wired that way because you've just gone through loads of um, polyester questions and polymer questions. This is essentially... What I can see here is what is DEP? Well, I know it's an ester, I mentioned that in the question. Also, I can know straight away because of this um, C linkage, my ester linkage, my COO linkage here, okay? And I've got my R's on the other side there, okay? So knowing that this is an ester, I know that an ester in this case is made up of a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. So if I just look here, so that's my product, and I look at my, um, sorry, re uh, reactant here. Um, this is very strangely enough. So what I would do here is I would just, anytime you're given the product, you just split it. You split it at the bridging oxygen, okay? Split it at the bridging oxygen. And that should really help you figure out what kind of an alcohol was given, what was it, was, is the second part of this reactant, okay? So if I look here, so again, obviously when this split up, I got my seed of one, oh, oh yeah, perfect. Um, so let's have a look here. What kind of alcohol was it? It's a two chained carbon, okay? And there's two of them. So what happened here, it was very typically, it was my ethanol. Yeah, C, H, 
3CH2OH. That's what it was. I'm not confusing with like um with a, a dye. Uh, a diol, not confusing this with um, a dicarboxylic acid. Okay, this is a this um, very simply here has been an ethanol, but two moles of them. So the answer is two. Okay, so two of these came in and just um, reacted with this acid here and made an ester. Okay, what I would always do with these questions is just split it at the ester linkage and it should give you a rough idea of what the carboxylic acid was and what the, the um, alcohol was. Okay, that's the first thing you should do before even writing down, down that. Now, what I should know as well is that I form um, just one water here because again, we're not dealing with polyesters, we're dealing with esters, okay? Esters are a condensation reaction, it's a removal of one water molecule. In this case, just because of the, um, the makeup of this, um, I, I, I use two lots of ethanol, okay, to make two ester linkages, okay? Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Um, deduce the number of peaks in carbon-13 spectrum of DEP. So deduce the number of peaks of CMR, okay, DEP. So again, uh, what I look at here is I need to figure out my carbon environments, okay? So hopefully you're kind of getting used to this and you should be able to answer them fairly easy. So um, what do I do? Let's have a look here. Um, so I've got these carbons. Oh, no, this is DEP. Apologies. Sorry. DEP. Um, so again, this is symmetrical. That's one carbon environment. I'll just I'll label them so. Mm -hmm. One, one, same carbon environment. Two, two, same carbon environment. Three, three same carbon environment. So the carbons, so looking at this benzene ring, um, these carbons here, there's no other carbon along here or part of this whole molecule that experience the same environment as these two do. Okay, so that's five and five, no, sorry, four and four. Again, another carbon, so these carbons here, this one and this one, experience the same environment. So number four is bonded to this um, chain here, and this is bonded to this thin chain here. The, the, the ones that are denoted five don't experience that, okay? And similarly then, the ones here, six and six. So the answer is six. Right. One of the peaks in the CNMR spectrum DEP is this. I'm going to get my data sheet in a second. Uh, table three in the data sheet. I should have it, although I don't know if my page can share it. Um, have your data sheet out in front of you anyway, and I'll, I'll just talk through because I can I can only share the screen. Um, da -da -da. Now, sheet can be used to identify the type of carbon atom responsible for the peak. So it's very important that you circle a carbon atom only. Draw a circle around one carbon atom that's res that, uh, of this type in the structure below. I'm getting tired now, my words are, <laughs> are slurring. Right, so if I open up my data sheet, you won't be able to see it because I haven't shared it, but if I look at my data sheet, I need to find 62 and what ranges fall within that. So let's have a look, scrolling down, CNMR. So, Looking at the is DEP, um, what falls between 60 that is that is um that matches up is probably the alcohols, ethers, or esters. Okay, and that's the 50 to 90 parts per million there. I, mean, I don't think you can see it on the screen, but if you open up your, your data booklet, it is the one, two, three, four, fifth one down. Um, and that's because of this carbon here. Is this carbon? It's the carbon oxygen bond here. Okay, which makes sense. Uh, now it does say identify the type of carbon atom. So do circle this carbon atom only. You can also circle this carbon atom instead if you like, but it's this carbon atom specifically responsible for the peak at 62 parts per million. Okay. Oh yeah, the next one. I have to apologize for this one, actually. Um, this question is part of the old spec. <laughs> so it's actually not, um, it, weirdly enough, back in the day when it came to the uh, um, mass spectrum, uh, you had to deal with radicals and everything. So what I will say 
is number one, I'm sorry. Number two, however, they can ask, um, they ask for, so write an equation, show the fragmentation of the molecular iron uh, ion to form the fragment that causes the peak. Um, right, <laughs> so um, the way you answer this now is not how it is in the Merkin scheme, because you're not really um, assessed on radicals in terms of mass spec anymore but they can ask you the type of fragment that causes this peak, okay? So what fragment causes this peak and can I write an equation for it and I'll show you how to do that. So um, how I would approach this question is what I know that the molecular ion peak, so pretty much the molecular mass of this whole um, DEP molecule is 222, okay? So if I had a spec like this, at the very, very far, 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 far right is my MIP, my mass ion peak, and it's 222. And it's also telling me that um, there is a peak at 177. So they want you to so write an equation to show the fragmentation of the mo molecular ion to, uh, ion to form the fragment caused. So what I'd look at is, okay, so what has fragmented off this molecule? Because remember, you have electrons, or depending, it could be electron spray ionization, it could be electron gun. Either way, um, something is fragmented, and it can be fragmented at absolutely any point. At any point, you can fragment this to pieces. Um, so what I'd look here is, okay, so what's come off here? What is, what is missing? So whatever is missing is, um, has been taken away to form a, hundred and, a mass 177. So if I do that 20, 222 minus 177, you will get 45. So there is a fragment with the mass of 45 that has come off this whole molecule, has fragmented off, okay? And has left two fragments. So fragmented off and whatever is remaining here. So is there anything um, that I could easily chip off here with the molecular mass of 45? So I'd start off with definitely what's branching off anyway. I wouldn't go near the benzene, um, making too much hard, hardship for yourself. Um, so if I, let's have a look at it. What if I chop this off? So a methyl, for example, a methyl ion, because um, again, um, this machine only picks up ions. So a carbon is 12 uh, plus it's 15. So it can't be that mass of 15, no. Uh, what if I chop it off here? What if, the, you know, a fragment happens here? So that's five plus 12 is 17, no. Okay, what if I fragment it here? Uh, 12 and 12 is 24 plus 29, no. But what if I fragment it here? 16 plus 24, 29, 45. So this actually equates to 45. This, if I chop this off and this is now fragmented, and anytime you show fragments, it must be shown as an ion because it is, a, you know, it's the mass spec. You must always draw a plus and put it in brackets. So that's fragmented off. So this is responsible for why, I mean, this is fragmented off. That's that's this gone here. And what's left behind is the remainder of this ion molecule that is a mass of 177, if that makes sense, okay? So what would I do here? There's a few ways you can go about this. Um, I can't, no, that's fine. So you can draw it out if you want, or you can write out the whole molecular formula. That's completely fine. There, there's no issue there as well. So there's, a, I, I, I tend to like to draw them out. Um, I had that, no, it's fine, it's fine. Right, so uh, you can draw it out. So you can just do this, draw the whole molecule. As an ion. Uh, so again, you just put in a bracket there and it's a plus. And what's happened is it is fragmented into two now because whatever the mass of 45, this is fragmented off to leave this behind. C O, yeah, and that's it. And then C O O, C H 2, C H 3, bracket and plus, and the second fragment is here. So that's you just draw an equation of that C H 3. There. Um, you can also draw the molecular 
a formula here. So if hopefully I don't get this wrong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So, so you can also do this. That's one accepted answer. You could do C12. <laughs> um, oh, one, two, three, four. Oh, four. Yeah. H, uh, so that's five and five is 10, um, 11, 12, 13, so yeah, H, five, 10, there's no H's there, 11, 12, 13, 14, yeah, H, 14, I'm pretty sure I'm right there. And again, you can do this either. And then you just show what was um, left behind. So, um, sorry, no, I am a bit tired. <laughs> so you can draw, um c one two three four five six seven eight c eight oh one two three oh three h five six seven eight nine again remember it must you if you don't have these pluses um you don't get the mark because you must all it, it they only put this machine only picks up ions remember it only picks up ions so you have to show them in that form uh plus and then um, C two O H five. I think that's right. Yeah. So either or. Okay. Um, again, this is. I think this is actually from two thousand eleven. So it's the old spec. Um, so it was a weird answer. You'd have to show like a radical. Um, going forward, um, if you draw if you draw the equation, you're just showing how this how this big molecule has fragmented into these two molecules, which coincide with the peaks mentioned, okay? I hope that makes a bit of sense there. I hope I've drawn that out okay. Yeah, I'm pretty confident with that. Uh, second last question. Okay, so because there are any uses, um, phthalates have been tested. Okay, an organization that represents the manufacturers of plasticizers asserts that experimental evidence and research findings show that these phthalates, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Again, I am tired. Do not pose a risk to human health because they biodegrade in a short time. Wonderful. I can see we're getting near the end here. According to the organization's research, um, phthalates um, sorry, do not represent a risk for humans or for the development um, and they biodegrade. So number one, hydrolysis of DEP in excess of water was found to follow first order kinetics. Wunderbar. Uh, write an equation um, which shows the hydrolysis reaction using DEP to represent the ester. So this is very, uh, very simply, you're sort of um, kind of the, your kind of your k here so the rate simply equals here so again small k okay hopefully that looks like a small k and then in brackets must 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 be in brackets dep that is the rate equation for the hydrolysis reaction using dep represent that that's it that is literally all you have to do there okay a lot of people got this wrong uh, if you spend more than a minute thinking about this, move on and come back to it at the very, very end, okay? Um, this is the second last one, apologies. So suggest what needs to be done so that the public could feel confident that the research um, discussed is reliable. So I'm guessing two marks mean two good points. Well, what makes anything reliable is that the experiment was repeated many times. So the experiment that they mention um, was repeated. That's one mark, okay? Another um, sign of reliability is that um, it was replicated by another scientist. That's really important. If I was doing an experiment loads and loads and loads of times and I repeat it loads of times, it's not reliable unless somebody else, my peer, hence peer assessed or peer reviewed, um, another scientist has done the same. So experiment replicated, meaning by another person, was replicated by another scientist, I should say. There's your other, other mark. Uh, one of the things that you could um, also add in that accept marks, there's, there's, there's huge um, uh, scope for this. You could say that it was made, research was made public. Um, you can also say what makes something quite reliable is that the experiment was done over a long period of time as well. So experiment done over a long period of time. 
Uh, and either one of those two will get you the marks. Okay. Anytime you, you look at reliability, it means that was rep it was it was repeatable, which means that the, the person doing the experiment could do it over and over again with the same results. And that it's reliable, it was replicated, which means that another scientist and peer was able to replicate that experiment, okay, and repeat it as well. Um, lovely. And last but not least, what statement is correct about polychloroethene? It has an empirical formula of, of CHCL, incorrect. Decolorizes brewing water. Apparently this year, that was the most common answer, but it's wrong. Because remember that obviously what causes the decoloration of yeah, decoloration of bromine water is the presence of the C C double bond. And in polychloroethene, there is no double bond. It's it's a saturated molecule. Polymers are saturated. But again, I think it's just not really thinking through the question, answered it straight away. It's brittleness, brittleness is reduced by plasticizers, and its polymer chain contains alternate single and double bonds. No, polymers are saturated anyway, these addition polymers anyway, this polychloroethene. The answer is, is brittleness is reduced by plasticizers. That's the answer, okay? So if you look at stuff like our plastic bags that we use, they're really, really kind of flexible and they're quite soft. The reason is because if you can imagine these long chains, usually stuck quite closely together. And again, you're required to know these forces in between uh, addition polymers. Um, usually they're quite tight net like this. If we want to make it more flexible, we place in these plasticizers, okay, which will increase the distance between the polymer chains, which means the van der Waal forces will get a bit weaker because you've increased the distance, the van der Waal forces isn't as strong, okay? Uh, and that's pretty much all, folks. Uh, I'm going to post it pretty quick. I don't want this. I don't even want to look at how long this took me. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, hopefully it was sort of some help. Any clarifications, guys, just, I mean, pause it, go back, look at how I've explained it. And if you still don't understand, do let me know. Uh, other than that, just, again, just keep it up, be consistent, okay? I'm here to support you. All right, thanks, guys.